tain na may buhok sa dulo. <laughs> Dead joke lang. Tain na tumai. <laughs> oh my god. Ambulacral groove. Amb <laughs> Ambulacral groove. The Kinoidea, the sea urchins, and... <laughs> Nagang. Ano nga yun? Echinoderms. What does it mean to be an echinoderm? All of these have what we call pentaradial symmetry. Much like a circle, when you bisect it right down the middle, you get two equal halves. But if you're pentaradially symmetrical, there are only five planes where that can happen, as is the case with many radially symmetrical or asymmetrical organisms, such as the sponges and cnidarians, and now we have echinoderms, they don't have a head. You can't discuss the tube feet without discussing the water vascular system, so we gotta put them together. The water vascular system exists to help the echinoderm move, whether it's itself or something else. It's the water vascular system that actually controls the tube feet. Think of the tube feet as being controlled by like a hydraulic system. Changes in the water pressure within this vascular system are what allow the tube feet to move. From the outside, the water goes into the madreporite, passes through the stone canal, which ends up in the central or the ring canal, which then radiates to the radial canals, ends up in the individual ampullae that control one tube foot each. And the echinoderm uses that for feeding, breathing, sensing the environment, among many other things. As the name suggests, echinoderm sort of translates to spiny skin. Catch connective tissue is also known as mutable collagenous tissue. This is typically the term you will find in many scientific literature. Literature. These are your collagen fibers. The underlying mechanism is that there are certain points along these fibers where you have a bunch of other proteins that can link the two fibers together. So when these proteins are linking the collagen fibers together, overall, if you're looking at it from like afar, that's what makes your echinoderm very rigid. There are also a bunch of proteins that they're like, huh, no, you can't link these two fibers together, bitch. The consequence of that is the cross links can't form. What you get, these, these two things can now just easily slide past each other. When you look at the organism from afar, you end up having a flexible organism. The amazing thing about catch connective tissue is it's controlled by the nervous system of your echinoderm. In a matter of seconds, they can be like, Hoo! and then after that, they can do Hoo! This whole thing about catch connective tissue is what gives them that remarkable ability of just suddenly losing arms. And they can do that at will. In the case of sea cucumbers, that would be their gonads, their digestive tract, and respiratory trees in some cases. You must be thinking, well, why don't they just stiffen up? Well, if they stiffen up, most likely the predator is gonna get to all of them and eat the whole thing. If I were the echinoderm, I'd just rather lose one part than lose my entire life. Give one arm away. After all, you have four more, diba? Right? Sharing is caring. Well, they can't just keep losing arms forever. What happens to the arms that they lost? And what happens to the part of the organism that just lost the arm? They can actually grow it back. The arm can grow back another body, and the body can grow back another arm. Whoa! Please note that the anatomy of echinoderms will have some slight variations depending on the major class to which it belongs. This one right here follows the typical plan of those under class asteroidia. There is no fucking face. So how am I supposed to look at this thing? Ab oral end is where you do not find the mouth and the oral side is where you find the mouth. The ambulacral zone, whether it's in the form of a groove or a bunch of holes down the test, that's where the tube feet come out. And then the interambulacral zones will be the ones where you don't find the tube feet. There are also these structures which we call pedicillariae. In some cases, they can be sessile. They're just kind of stuck there on a surface. And then there are versions where they actually have a stalk and they can shoot up there are also times when the actual claws have sacks of poison and they can be released. What are these for? Oh shit, there's a piece of debris on me and I want to get it off. I'm gonna just use my other arm to get it out. But no, they don't do it like that. So they have these pedicillariae that kind of keep the stuff out and serve as like housekeeping. They're also used for defense. Among all the invertebrate groups we have so far encountered, so far encountered, because we still haven't talked about hemichordates, echinoderms are more closely related to us based on a key feature. Early in life, we all started out as assholes. Or in science, this is what we call deuterostome development. Kaya ewan ko ano ba pinagbamalaki natin, di ba? Echinoderms can be broadly classified into three main clades in a fairly self-explanatory fashion. Mukhang lilies, mukhang stars, mukhang masakit. Brittle stars and sea stars form the clade Asterozoa. Di ba obvious naman? Kasi nga, mukhang stars. Echinoidea, the sea urchins, and Holothoroidea, the sea cucumbers, they form the group Echinozoa. And for Crinozoa, that's just Crinoidea. Loners. Kaya unahin na natin sila. <laughs> Crinoidea comprises your feather stars and your sea lilies. And those are the two main body forms. So what's the main difference? Sea lilies are the ones with the stalk. And then there are the feather stars which do not have the stalk, but instead the structure that allows them to stick to a surface 
is what you call cirri. Many of the existing or the extant sea lilies that we have live in the deep sea. The feather star form is actually the more dominant form that exists today for crinoids. Like if you're talking crinoids, most likely these are the ones you're gonna see. You typically find them in shallow waters, coral reefs, and they're kind of like sitting on top of a piece of coral or whatever. They're just catching the waves. So why do you only really find sea lilies in the deep sea? Why are feather stars the more predominating form of crinoids? Why? The main difference is that the other one just has a stalk and the other one does not. What difference could that possibly make in an environment that has a lot of moving water? Members of Crinoidea are also the only members of Echinoderms that their arms kind of look like feathers. Why? They are suspension feeders. You just kind of pick up whatever the water throws at you. Having feathery arms allows them to get a lot more food. Plus, the arms and the pinules, they not only serve a feeding function, they actually also serve a bit of a respiratory function. Surface area to volume ratio. How do they move in their environment? Kalad Karen, look at her go, dragging her body across the floor like it's nobody's business. In extreme cases where they don't want to just drag themselves across the floor, they can go Westlife mode and start flying without wings. It's like if your mop head decided, I don't want to clean up your shit anymore, I'm gonna just float away. <laughs> For other groups of echinoderms, the mouth and the anus are on opposite ends. The anus is usually, if present, on the aboral surface. But crinoids, they kind of like to shit where they eat. The mouth and the anus both face upwards. Arms with the pinules with the tube feet in there, bringing the food towards the center where the mouth is. Paano kung tumayo yung crinoid? Tapos yung tai niya, nahagip ng tubig, tapos kumapit dun sa tube feet niya. Kakainin ba niyo ulit yung tai niya? And this little clip here can give us a partial answer to that existential question. You need the help from a friend. In this case, it's a gastropod. Are they kissing? Is the gastropod kissing ass? It's really hard to tell. <laughs> what do you think? Subphylum Asterozoa, or the star animals, most obviously contains the two classes, Asteroidea, the star-like animals, and Ophiroidea, the snake-tail-like animals. Those are the literal translations of their names, at least for the members of clade Asterozoa. Another thing that you want to pay attention to in terms of morphology would be the central disc and then the rays. The rays are also what we would typically call the arms. For Asteroidea, you don't really know where that central circle starts or ends. It kind of just merges neatly with the rays. For Ophiroidea, the central disc, it's very distinct. For sea stars, there are actually open grooves. So it's like the tube feet just come out of those open channels. For Ophiroids, there are actually ventral plates running down each arm. There are kind of holes on those plates and the tube feet come out of those holes. So the ambulacral system is closed. In the central disc, there are two slits at the base of each arm. And that is kind of used for respiration and a brooding chamber. Kaya nga, Ophiroidea, they primarily use the flexibility of their arms more than their tube feet. The tube feet for Ophiroids are used to bring the sediment that's in their vicinity to the mouth and then they kind of pick up the organic matter and then they expel whatever they don't need. They're deposit feeders. Whereas for Asteroids, or the sea stars, they kind of rely more on the tube feet for movement. Some species can actually bring a section of their stomach outside into the world and digest their prey externally. Parts of their digestive tract and their gonads actually extend towards each ray. That's why they have the ability to regenerate an entire new organism because they kind of have most of their bits and pieces within each arm. So for your Ophiroids, their arms are just really mostly just arms. For Ophiroidia, the main representative you have for your lab is just macro field tricks. Ngayon, may marinig din kayong common name na basket stars. Ano naman yung pinagkaiba ng basket stars sa brittle stars? May central disc and then yung arms, but then the arms also kind of have other arms, but not to the extent like crinoids na feathery yung itsura. For them, it kind of looks more like maybe vines. You know, there's antique na chandelier that has a main and then suddenly there's a main and then there's a main and then there's a main. That's the deep sea. You can see it easily. Those are your brittle stars. You find these in tide pools or stuck under rocks, crevices. If you try to pick it out, what it'll do is, there's no way you're gonna get me out of this place, bitch. No. Take my arms. Kya brittle stars. All of the representatives in your lab manuals belong to the order of Valvatida. The ones that are grouped under Spinalocida in your manuals are actually now under Valvatida as well. These two, Linkia and Nardoa, are under the family Ophidiasteridae. Ophis means snake. Sila yung mga medyo mahaba yung arms, na medyo mukhang ahas siguro. This guy right here is part of the family Oriasteridae. Another sea star belonging to the same family that you might also commonly see in the beaches would be the chocolate chip sea star. These groups of sea stars, their body is bulkier. Overall, they're a lot stiffer. Also, the central disc is like bigger. You could say that these are the more robust looking sea stars. The carpet sea star is part of the group Asterinidae. The members of this group are pretty small. They're more pentagonal in shape. Sina Linkia, Nardoa na talagang arms, 
arms, arms for days. See na parang. If you look at it closely, it kind of has a knitted pattern. So mukha siyang kin rocher. Ganun yung parang texture no ab oral surface niya. Arkester belongs to the family Arkesteridae. They're usually in sediment, shallow waters, tidal areas. Yung kulay nila parang mukha kulay putik. Parang ah, syempre, camouflage. Arkester is often mistaken for a different species which belongs under a different family and a different order altogether. That other species belongs to the genus Astropectin under the family Astropectinidae under the order Paxillosida. Medyo magkalayo sila systematically. However, they look very, very similar. And that's because they're living in the same environments. So this is an example of what you call convergent evolution. For Arkester, the spines are kind of flat and blunt. For astropectin, they're really pointed. For arcaster, the tube feet kind of look like suckers, so they kind of have like suction cups at the end. But for astropectin, the tube feet are pointed. There is an amazing scientist named Dr. Christopher Ma, and his blog discusses it in more detail. So I'll leave a link somewhere in the description. I really highly encourage you to just go ahead and read that. If you're part of like the marine biodiversity industry, if you're a diver, you would normally hear these abbreviated as COTS crown of thorns. If you just let them have an outbreak, they can really eat a huge percentage of corals overnight. That's why divers, they actively take them out before things blow out of proportion. How do we manage this? Do we just keep on diving and taking them out of the water when they're adults? Yeah, that can help, but that really doesn't solve the problem. It might be better to actually get to the root of the issue. If you look at starfish larvae, they're planktonic. So many things much bigger than them can actually eat them. But why are so many of them surviving to adulthood? And that's because of a lot of the shit we put in the ocean. And that makes it more favorable for them to rapidly grow and develop and survive. And bam, outbreak. It's still our fault. <laughs> When is it not our fault? The management of these types of ecosystems, you know, very fragile, and you really have to look at it from like a larger perspective as well. Ito na naman to. Back in the day, they used to belong under their own class, but more recently, they are now subsumed under class Asteroidea. So from the name itself, Concentricycloidea, it has a lot to do with the arrangement of their water vascular system. It appears like concentric rings. Their tube feet are also arranged circumferentially, which makes sense because the water vascular system is also arranged in a ring form. Silos is wood, plaques is plate. It was first found found in deep sea wood. Nahanap siya sa kahoy, mas mukha siyang plato. Kaya siloplax yung pangalan niya. We have clade or subphylum Echinozoa, and here you have the two classes, Echinoidea and Holothuroidea. They're very, very different looking right off the bat, so I think it's very easy to distinguish these two groups. Now, if the spines aren't a dead giveaway that this is a sea urchin, the skeleton of your sea urchins are fused to form a test. You're also gonna see another hard structure inside, Aristotle's lantern. That's kind of like their jaws. Alam niyo sa arcade, the claw machine that picks up the stuffed toy, even in the fused test, you're going to see that there are the ambulacral and the interambulacral zones. Along that test, there are only certain points where the tube feet can come out. You could say that Echinozoa is a subphylum where the polar opposites are like put together in one group for God knows why. So you have this group where everything is so solid and rigid. You have a group where everything is like super flexible. In their case, the calcareous ossicles are microscopic. Think sponge spicules. Yung pangalan na holothuroidea. Depending on your source, some would say there's really no clear translation for it. And then there's also one that I found. It translates to violent expulsion. They can do something extraordinary when they are stressed or under attack. Evisceration. Evisceration can be in the form of the cuvirian tubules. When it comes into contact with anything, it becomes this really sticky, annoying thing. Or it can be in the form of true evisceration, in which case they expel the gonads, digestive system, respiratory trees. If you look at this other extreme, you have echinoids. Their defense is all of these spines and this really rigid test. Whereas for holothuroids, they don't have that option. So what are they gonna do? Blech. What are the respiratory trees? They're kind of like the lungs, except <laughs> they're attached to the anus. They can't sit down. They can't sit with us! Because if they sit down, they won't be able to breathe. Isipin mo kung ganun yung baga mo, nakakabit dun sa butas ng pwet mo. Bawal ka rin umupo. Asan yung tube feet dyan? They kind of have two types of tube feet, you could say. One would be the oral tube feet, which we would also call the oral tentacles. That's the stuff that comes out of the oral end, grabbing the food and all of that. And then there are also what we would call the ambulacral tube feet. Kahit pa paano, kinaiinisan to ng mga turista kasi nga naman talaga, pag natapakan mo, kahit naka-aquasius ka, paminsan, tagus pa rin. If you really want to get into the nitty-gritty of distinguishing echinoids morphologically, it will require close inspection of the plates of the test, the Aristotle's lantern, the morphology of the spines. All of which, unfortunately, will require the specimen to be dead. But under normal circumstances, like for example, when you're on your beach vacation, you're never really gonna see them dead unless you see something wash up the shore. 
you're often gonna see this in the ocean, alive, spines sticking out. So all I'm gonna say is, do not touch. The most observable difference in sea urchin morphology that can help us at least pick out one clade is based on whether or not they are regular or irregular echinoids. Ano ba yung ng dalawang yan? Regular echinoids are more globular, whereas irregular echinoids are more flattened. Regular echinoids, longer spines. Irregular echinoids, shorter spines. Regular echinoids, you almost always find them at the surface of the substrate. For irregular echinoids, they're typically burrowing species. So nakikita nyo na ngayon bakit maikli yung spines, tapos bakit mas flatten yung itsura ng mga irregular echinoids. Yun yung lifestyle nila, they dig under the substrate. The irregular echinoids are placed under one clade, which is infraclass irregularia. O diba, napakadaling tandaan. Your representative for the laboratory would be Clypeaster, which is under order Clypeasteroidea, family Clypeasteridae. Sand dollars, sea biscuits, sea cookies, sea cakes, cake urchins. Then the rest of these are part of the regular echinoids. At least dito sa mga nandito sa lab natin, you can first split them based on the morphology of the Aristotle's lantern. Infraclass Carinacea, and then you have infraclass Oladonta. Heterocentrotus is under the family Echinometridae, and Toxocnustes and Tripnustes are under the family Toxocnustidae. If you have these two side by side, have a look at the hole where the Aristotle lantern would come out. Kung yung butas na yun, may mga dati, So there are really deep notches. That would most likely be part of family Toxocnustidae. But again, this is just comparing these two families. If you have like all the other families side by side, medyo ibang kwento na yun, and mas marami ka nang dapat tignan na features. So for Toxocnustis, their pedicillaria are kind of like whew, flower shaped and they're very toxic. Remember Xenophora, the carrier shell, and then the decorator crab? Now, we have a sea urchin that kind of does the same thing. It's the collector urchin. Using its pedicillaria, it kind of picks up debris and it covers itself with all of the garbage of the sea so that it will look like a piece of shit. Add that to your Asian mom hoarder family. When it senses that it is in danger, it will release the pedicillaria and then these things will just start floating into the water and randomly clamp into whatever is closest to it. If your hand is there and kumapit dun yung pedicillaria, then aray ko! Now let's have a look at this order, which is order diadema toida. Their spines are either hollow or if they're kind of filled, it's kind of filled with like a mesh-like kind of thing. Diadema setosum, fairly common in shallow water. So ingat kayo pag nasa beach kayo. Kasi naglalakad kayo, mababaw pa lang, nandun na siya. When you get stabbed by the spines, the treatment for this, binababad sa hot water, tapos may vinegar. Ito namang echinothrix sila, they have two sets of spines. So the ones that you see right now, yung banded, those are the longer spines. And then there are also shorter spines. We we are done with the notorious group, which is Echinoidea. Let's move on to the group na mukhang tae. Hindi, joke. Holothuroidea. Sea cucumbers. Sea cucumbers can be broadly divided into two main groups. This one we have here is order Apodida. Many of the representatives in this order do not have ambulacral tube feet. So the only tube feet that they have are the modified tube feet, which would be the oral tentacles or the oral tube feet. Their body wall is fairly thin and they don't have respiratory trees and also they do not have cuvirian tubules. The fact that their body wall is thin allows for gases to just diffuse through their bodies. So ano pang point ng respiratory trees? How do they move? Apart from longitudinal muscles, they also have circular muscles, peristaltic movement. Very, very similar to segmented worms. Fairly common kahit shallow water, Sinapta maculata. This one I've seen personally. Some of the things that tour guides would warn you about would be sea snakes, banded sea snakes or sea crates. So si Sinapta maculata, Ayun, medyo gaya-gaya po tumay. <laughs> Yan ang tawag nga sa kanya is the snake sea cucumber. Kasi mukha siyang ahas. It has that banding pattern. The first time you see it, lalo na kung hindi ka familiar, parang hoo! For the sea cucumber, that's exactly the point. These guys are under subclass Actinopoda. Order Holothurida. Family Holothuridae. Itong mga to, meron na yung Cuvirian tubules. Their gonads are just on one side. Actinopaiga lecanora. Leca, so liuka, di ba? Has something to do with white. And then ora means tail. Di ba parang target na target yung point niya? Look at my white ass. <laughs> this guy right here, is part of order Sinalactida, family Stichopodidae. Members of family Stichopodidae, they are fairly robust. If you take a cross section of their body, it kind of appears squarish. And a lot of them have really prominent papillae. Telenota ananas. Pineapple sea cucumber. Ano ba talaga? Cucumber o pineapple? Nakairi. Right off the bat, they look really, really diverse. Iba yung itsura ng asteroids, ophiroids, holothuroids, echinoids, and crinoids. You can't mistake one for the other. And kahit ganun nga na sobrang iba-iba yung itsura nila, apart from, you know, the, the morphological features that we've already discussed, all of them are really slow as fuck. 
fairly helpless. How is it that they've survived this long with so many pressures on predation? Ekainoidea, they decided to take the route of aggressive violence and spines and pedicillary with toxins. Holothuroidea, their strategy is bleh, being really disgusting, toxic in many cases, and also just hiding, using camouflage. Members of Asterozoa, your asteroids and your ophiroids, they decided to hide in tight spaces, or in worst case scenarios, they could just shed parts of their body and give it away to the predators. As for crinoids, they're a little more on the mobile side, so they can actually actively swim away, or again, worst case scenario, give up part of their arms. Being a slowpoke not only means you're more prone to predation, how are you going to reproduce? Find a mate. You're all so slow if you're an organism that either you can't move or you're or super Ocean and have it all mixed together. It's bahala na. Kahit na sabihin mo suntok sa buwan. Ang ginagawa nila, marami. The more entries, the more chances of winning. Or, thanks to Catch Connective Tissue, you can instantaneously just shed one part of your body. That arm can regrow a whole new body. The remaining body can regrow another arm. That's also one way of reproducing. If we look back to the very first lesson from Porifera up until now, it kind of varies. Try to think of all of these strategies to survive in their particular environment. Life finds a way. And this way is just not one way. Marami na tayo nakilalang echinoderms. Eh, ano naman? Ano bang pakialam ko sa mga mukhang stars, mukhang tae, or yung mga mukhang masakit, tapakan? Like all things in nature, kailangan meron tayong mga tagalinis ng mga dumidumi, mga etchas, at kung ano-ano. Sea cucumbers, ophiroids, and some echinoids are deposit feeders, and crinoids are suspension feeders. So a lot of them are actually cleaning our oceans day in, day out. That's what they do for us. Cleaning our shit to maintain a healthy ecosystem apart from the janitors you also need to have the population controllers as usual predators prey Ni naman nawawala yan. in any ecosystem there has to be predator there has to be prey some species like diadema setosum and acanthaster can indicate the quality of your reef ecosystem in that sense they also serve as bioindicators or sentinel species kung kunyari may nakikita kayo dun sa beach ecosystem ninyo or sa coral reef ecosystem ninyo na marami ng diadema hmm mag-isip-isip na kayo bakit kaya napakaraming long spine urchin so that can also indicate poor reef quality. Alam naman natin ang paghasik ng lagim ng cut sa ating mga corals. Pagka nagka-outbreak ng crown of thorns, you get like a, a lot of people involved to help remove these adults before they decimate the reefs. Hindi naman yung pagkakita nyo agad ng crown of thorns, ah, tanggalin na agad. So, kung may isa, dalawa, okay lang yun. Kasi they're naturally part of a reef ecosystem. What's really scary is when they reach a certain amount. Usually, you can consult with marine biologists on that para ma-assess nila kung gaano ka-healthy yung reefs ninyo. And they can recommend some strategies for you to be able to really make sure that you can keep your coral reefs healthy. Some sea stars, particularly those under class Asteroidea, a lot of them are still being sold, you know, in beach shops as souvenirs. So would I recommend collecting or buying these types of souvenirs? No. Calcium carbonate in particular is like the most generic hard material for many living organisms, including our cells, our teeth, our bones, the shells of mollusks, the shells of crustaceans. The are also calcium based. We already tackled this in earlier discussions. The importance of keeping these things in the ocean so that the cycle of the minerals and everything is not disrupted so that we don't deplete the ocean of calcium for the next generation of organisms that need the calcium to build their shells and whatnot. Kung sure ka na hindi siya toxic, maybe you can try to like touch it a little bit. Siyempre, out of curiosity. Gusto mo rin naman magkaroon ng positive experience with nature. Wala naman bawal sa ganong klaseng interaction. Pero yung to the point na you will cause it some sort of stress or harm, then don't interact with it in that way. Just leave it in the water. Don't pick it up. Let it do its own thing. Pag tinanggal nyo yan sa tubig, eh di biglang, di ba, madidehydrate yung organism. Respetuhin din natin na may buhay din yung mga yan. At may mga kanya-kanya rin silang gustong gawin sa buhay nila. Siguro naman, kung ikaw yung nasa katayuan nila, na meron nalang biglang higante na gaganyan-ganyanin ka, uy, ano ba to? Tapos pinulot ka, tapos tinabi ka dun sa boobs niya, isipin nyo yung bibig yung nakatapat sa boobs ninyo. Tapos ang dami-dami pa ang tube feet. And those tube feet, they can taste. Parang isipin nyo nalang, how would you feel if you were forced into somebody else's boobs? Um, okay, maybe some people might actually like that, but if I were a sea star, um, no, because I'm lactose intolerant. Joke! <laughs>
There are also several echinoderms, particularly for holothuroidians. So they secrete the substance called holothurin, which is being explored to have some pharmaceutical application. Mother nature is like a buffet of medicine. All of these toxic substances at some point can be used as medicine. Sabi nga nila, it's the dose that makes the poison. Pagkain! Japanese and their sea urchin gonads, the Chinese and their Asian seafood hotpot, kalimitan may kasama ang sea cucumber. Uh, ang sea cucumber, their calcium-based ossicles are embedded in that connective tissue. Pag kinain mo sila, there's that little bit of crunch. Gritty, crunchy, kunat factor. Tas malaman-laman mo na ganun pala, it breathes through its butt, tapos it spills out its guts. Sa larangan naman ng ecotourism, the fact that they have these really vibrant colors and these weird shapes, they are wonderful subjects for underwater photography. The thing with cots outbreaks, kung pangit yung corals ninyo, edi walang pupuntang turista. For diadema, pag nakatapa ka ng sea urchin, edi sira yung bakasyon mo, di ba? Kasi parang umiyak ka na lang ng buong trip mo. Oh my god, natapa ako ng sea urchin. Sometimes even painful experiences can be positive experiences. It really depends on your perspective. Ako kung gusto nyo pang matuto tungkol sa mga echinoderms, I suggest you check out these resources right here. Ang dami, dami, dami. Also, these videos, I'm gonna leave them up here. Have fun. And again, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you again.